Hey, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Good. Hey, it's so good to see you. Hey, if you haven't been here in a while, you're brand new. My name is Davey Nelson. I'm the Worship Arts Director here at Kensington's Clinton Township Campus. So welcome. It is so good to see all of you here. We are so excited that we are in week three of our Unfiltered Jesus series. And uh, before we get started, we wanted to open up with a song uh, called Face to Face. And this is a song that was actually written here at Kensington by some artists, myself and our music director, Jared, included in that um, for this series. And if uh, you were here a few weeks ago, or you've been with us, you know that our senior pastor, Brian Mowry, is leading us through this series for the year, this theme called Above All. And a part of that is this idea that we want to know the one. We want to know who God is. We want to know Jesus. And so we wrote this song called Face to Face as a way for us to express a, a real deep desire, a heart cry for our church and our community to know who Jesus is so close that we could be face to face with him. So I'd love to invite you. Would you, would you stand with us as we sing out this morning? And again, like I said, this is a time for us to express in worship our desire and our cry to know Jesus, to know him truly revealed as he is fully, fully man, fully God, a servant king, a loving Lord, and to know him face to face. Let's sing.
You guys can have a seat, man. It's so cool to be part of a place. You know, that song was written by a few of our worship leaders here and a few of our music directors. Jared and Davey both had a hand in that. And just to have such a talented group of people to lead us in worship every week. Isn't that amazing? Can we take a second and thank them again for bringing their talents, gifts, and abilities? It's so cool. Uh, My name is Sam. I'm one of the uh, guys who work around here. And so we are super excited that you guys are here today. Now, uh, retreat season is upon us here at Kensington, and we are so excited. And so I want to take a few minutes and just talk to you about two of those this morning. The first one is man camp. How many of you were at man camp last year? Okay, Jim, you were at man camp? Did everyone hear that Jim was at man camp? <laughs> I said, were you at man? He goes, yeah. Awesome. Let me see a show of hands again. How many of you were at man camp? Okay, all right, beautiful. Listen, that means that most of you need to go this year. It is absolutely incredible, and it's happening this next weekend, October 6th through the 8th. It's up at Spring Hill Camp, and here's the deal. This is a time where you break away from your routine. You break away from the, you know, the, the, the weekend projects, the honey-do lists, all those things, and it's an opportunity to come together with some guys. We have zip lining. We have all kinds of competitions, all kinds of sports, all kinds of discussion breakouts. We have awesome, impactful services. I mean, it is a great time to get together. We have late-night bonfires. I mean, the whole deal. It's an awesome time to get together with some guys, to hang out, to build some new relationships, and just kind of refocus going into the fall. And so if you want to register for that, you can register online at uh, kensingtonchurch.org slash mancamp. But here's the deal. Registration's open until we start. So if you decide like Thursday night, you know, I think I'm going to go to that. You can just show up on Friday. We would love, I mean, that's how guys roll, right? It's like, come on, just bring it, you know? And here's the deal too. It's Friday evening, all day Saturday, and then Sunday into the afternoon. If you got to leave Saturday Saturday night because you got to get back for the Lions, we get that, okay? All right, come to part of it, come to all of it, but do your best to get there. It is an awesome time. I'm going to be there. Adam's going to be there. Jim's going to be there, right, Jim? Yep. You didn't say, yeah. I expected a, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So come hang out. We would love to have you there. The other retreat I want to tell you about is for middle schoolers and high schoolers. It's called Wild Retreat. It's also up at Spring Hill, and it is absolutely incredible. I had the privilege to go last year and to see these students. Man, when you take middle schoolers and high schoolers out of their routine, out of their rhythm, you get them out of the house, you get them away from their screens, you get them away from their typical friends, and you take them to a place like this where there's all kinds of programming, all kinds of fun and games and services, I mean, something special can really happen. Last year, we saw kids that just really radically connected with God in this weekend. And so if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler in your life, I would encourage you to get them here. It's, it's October 20th through 22nd. And if you're interested, you can uh, sign up on the website. There'll be a graphic that comes up in a few minutes. But also, I would encourage you to go talk to Christina out there. You know, all the, did you guys see all the RC cars when you came in and the robotic snake and the whole deal? That's a party. That is our middle school ministry around here. So go talk to Christina after service. She would love to give you more details, but there's the graphic. Kensingtonchurch.org slash wild. Great way to, uh, for your students to connect and to set the trajectory for the fall as well. Also, if you want to get involved in anything around here, we have groups, we have move out teams, we have all kinds of things happening in the life of our church. Go to the hub out in the lobby. The hub is where you got these people standing in these bright orange shirts, and they would absolutely love to connect with you. They'd love to get you connected, answer any questions that you have, and get you pointed in the right direction. Because Sunday morning is just a fraction of what this church is and what this faith community is. And so we want to encourage and invite you to join us. So visit the hub, stop by there for all things Kensington and all the ways to get involved. Cool? Can I get a little head nod? Cool? You're with me? Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. So we're in this Unfiltered Jesus a series, which is incredible. I got to share last week, and I do just want to take a second before we move on to uh, what Adam's going to bring with Sacrificial Savior today. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I showed some uh, pictures of Jesus at the beginning of my talk last week, and so I just want to pause, and I want to apologize if those, <laughs> some of you are laughing, I do want, I want to apologize, seriously, um, if any of that sort of offended you or 
or I cast Jesus like in an irreverent light or like dishonoring situation because I want you to hear that's not my heart. That's not my intention. Uh, I never want to do anything that gets in the way of people seeing Jesus. And so if anything that I shared towards the beginning of my talk last week did that, I want to apologize and I want to say, hey, listen, please hear my heart, hear my intention. I just want to make Jesus famous. I want to point you to him. And so if I've done anything to kind of detract from that, I'm sorry. Cool? Cool? Okay, cool. Right on. Some of you are like, what's he talking about? Definitely going to watch last week. Um, But no, listen, we are super excited that you are here today. Today is Name Tag Sunday. And so the question was, what's your favorite cider mill? So who's got a favorite cider mill? What is it? Let me hear it. Okay, I heard Blake's. I heard that was basic. When I said Blake's this morning, they were like, you're not writing Blake's, right? That's basic. I was like, oh, dang. All right, okay. What else? What what were some other ones? Yates. Yates has the best donuts, not going to lie. I'm with that. Someone first service said Kroger. I was like, okay, that's the economic option. I can get with that, I guess. Okay, excellent, cool. Well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite you to stand up, crisscross the auditorium, shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck, meet somebody new, and the great icebreaker question is, what's your favorite cider mill? Glad you guys are with us today. Well, good morning, everyone. How are y'all? Good, yes. Kroger. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. Uh, no, uh, I can say that because it was one of, our, one of our people that said it. So, uh, hey, um, I would guess if you're at all like me in this room, you have a desire to be the hero at some point, right? Like, don't we all want to be the hero where people are looking to us or they're cheering for us, they're excited about what it is that we do? Yesterday, I was reminded of a, of a tiny way I get to be the hero in my household. So we hosted a funeral yesterday, which meant I got up and I left, and April was home with the kids, and I uh, was not here too long where she sent me a text message of a spider. So and she sent me the text message to prove to me the size of the spider, which I went home and saw. But she, uh, then when I got hold, told me a little bit more about the story. When she saw the spider, the first thing she did was screech my name, right? Like, I am! And then she realized I wasn't home. So if the spider was removed, it was all up to her, right? Which was really interesting because there is a dynamic in my house where there's a spider or a critter, and it's not just April, it's London. Girl won't sleep in her room if there's an insect unless I go up and take care of it where I get to be the hero, right? They yell for dad and I swoop into the day and I come here and my imaginary cape is blowing and I smile and the glistening off of the teeth. And I was thinking about it. You know, there's also moments where my wife who is here in the first service is the hero. I can remember one very vividly. It was back uh, many years ago when we lived in Pennsylvania and I was bathing. I believe it was Lincoln, but I can't hold him to that. And as we're bathing, I sudden notice that there's things in the tub. That, that I didn't put in there, right? So the same screech happened, but the name was different. I was like, hey, bro, right? <laughs> because I needed a hero in that moment. And it's funny, that seems to happen when a diaper excessively goes. So I'm sensing a pattern in the ways that I yell for April, right? But, but there is something in that. And, and when, when we long for a hero in our life, there's a way we want our hero to act. Like there's times where my name gets screamed because of the insect, and I do that run and jump in superhuman moment, superhero moment. There's other times where I'm like, freaking, you, me, like you can't kill the spider, right? And nobody wants to be on the other end of a hero like that. Nobody wants their hero coming in, saving them and belittling or making them feel less than in a certain way because they are in a position where they need to receive something from somebody. It's never good to feel torn down in that manner. I just want to say, like unashamedly, in this church at Kensington, we believe the hero of the story of life for all of us is Jesus. 
We believe that there is a hero that he came to save us as we're gonna get into this day as Sam told you about a sacrificial savior and the great thing about him is we don't think that he approaches us in the way that I do sometimes with my children or spouse because I don't wanna have to deal with their insect. And what we are going to do to prove that or to demonstrate is we're gonna look at Jesus's words specifically as he said. This is that unfiltered Jesus where it's not coming from us, it's coming from something that he said himself. And as he does this, we're gonna get to see the type of hero of a story that he is. But but before we get into the text to do that today, we're gonna take a moment and pray and receive our offerings. Would you all just go ahead, bow your heads with me as we prepare for this morning. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for the character that you display through it and how when we really look at it and see it, we get to see what God looks like when we look at the life of Jesus. Such an important thing that we get to understand. May we all have a little bit of that opened up to us and enlightened as we leave here today. I want to ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, our ushers are going to come down right now, and they're going to pass the offering bags. First, let me say, hey, if you're a guest, you haven't been attending here regularly, we don't want you to feel any obligation like you need to participate. There are handles on each side of that bag. You can grab it and pass it right to your neighbor. I know some of you have come prepared to give. I want to thank you in advance, and some of you would like to give in a little more modern way. You can text the uh, number on the screen, download our app, or go to our website. Always, that you can give. And I want to say thank you for what it is that you do, because we cannot do any of it without y'all partnering us. And I want to highlight one thing in this moment. Every fall, we are a part of helping an organization called McCrest. And McCrest's mission is to help individuals who are caught in the dynamic of being homeless. And we used to house them here and we support them by giving donations, preparing luncheons and different dynamics. And we need your help to make that happen. We've got a couple of weeks before this comes into full fruition. But we have about 150 items that we need donated so we can give to them to house both men, women, and children so that they can have a warm space in this experience they are a part of, which then actually helps them understand how we care about them, gives us the opportunity to share Jesus, but then really just allows them to go find a job and do the types of things that a lot of us take for granted. So I'd encourage you, after the service, stop at the wood wall a little bit out to your left as you're walking out and uh, check those donations out. See if there's something that you might be able to do to help us invest and care for those people in that situation. So let's jump back to this idea of Jesus as a sacrificial savior. See, as I say Jesus is a sacrificial savior, some of you in this room might think, yeah, I'm not sure exactly that's what pops to my mind. See, a lot of us have an opinion about God, or maybe we don't even believe God is real, but but if we did, we would look at certain things and say, this is kind of what's defined who he is to us. Some of you, maybe you grew up in a church and they taught the Bible a certain way and because of that, you have a certain definition or belief about who God is or maybe for some of you you had a friend or or a coworker or a boss and man, they just shine the light of Jesus as I would say it's communicated in this book in such a good way where you're like, yeah, I can kind of get the bend of sacrificial savior but for others of you, there's anything but the type of savior you would wanna follow is who you think the God of the Bible is. And I know that because I've seen that even coming from pastors. When I was in uh, Savannah, I uh, was on staff at a church working, and it was a Saturday. I was watching TV, and as I was flipping through a channel, there was this southern pastor that came on. And man, I just want to tell you, the guy could preach. Like, I don't know if all you but somebody gets in it like this, and they get going. I like that stuff, right? But he's on the TV, and I quickly in my opinion, felt something that was out of step. He starts talking about giving to his ministry, which is not something we would say you shouldn't do. We do it here, but the way that he did it was different. He starts communicating to people that he believes God wants to help them become removed from their debt, which is something that I believe, and I believe the Bible teaches it. But then he launches into, if you give me $1,000 now, even if it's on the credit card, God's gonna help you pay off that $1,000 and pay the rest of it. And I can tell you, I've read this book, covered a couple, a couple of times, that is crap. Like, it's funny, but in the moment it wasn't. Like, the reason I understand that people have a bad opinion of Jesus, and I am just as capable of doing this, is when we show him in a poor light. And if I could have gone through the TV and throat punched that man, I might have. (laughs) Occasional anger problem, right? (laughs) Pray for your pastor. I'm just like every single one of you. But see, that's the reality. Is like Jesus came in a certain light, and when we don't depict him well, 
There are certain definitions of who he is that we will, people will take on in their lives. And I saw that happening in this moment. And a lot of you understand that. But one of the realities is Jesus did come to be a savior. And when you come to be a savior, there are certain things that people will think about you. Saviors can be arrogant. They can be ill-tempered. Look at your favorite character in a superhuman. Some of them are great, and sacrificial savior would be a definition, but others just aren't. So when I hear people talk about Jesus, and it fits into a certain category, man, there's something that we have to do about it. But the reality is Jesus did come claiming to be a savior. Very first time the person of Jesus comes to the world as a baby, this is depicted. I know many of you are familiar with the Christmas story where the shepherds are in the field and the angels come and they announce. And the text tells us the first thing they say is, hey, don't be afraid. But then this is what the angels say to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. It says, don't be scared because today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. See, very early on in Jesus' life, in his time here, the shepherds were told by the angels exactly why it was that Jesus came. He came to be a savior. He came because he saw a people, a group that he loved that was his prized creation, and they were living, me, all of us, in such a way that was separating us from him. So he came to restore the relationship that he wants with us. And this is not even close to the only time this claim is made. Mary and Joseph, Jesus' mother, are told this in Luke 1 and Matthew 1, that Jesus is coming to be the Savior. And I went through and did a little Google search and looked in my Bible on my own. I can see at least 26 different references in the gospel accounts, which are the four accounts of Jesus' life, and then all of the letters written to the church by Jesus' disciples in here, where he specifically says, the reason that I came was to be the Savior. Which leads us to then ask ourselves a question. If Jesus was coming, claiming to be a savior, that would indicate or mean that there's a certain group of people that need saving. Now, if you're like me, there can be moments in our life where we don't like to put ourselves in that category, and we might not necessarily think we need saving, but I'd like to do a little mental thought exercise with you. Um, we might not think that we need saving, but we can all think of somebody who needs saving. Can I get an amen in the church? Right? Like it might not be me, but my neighbor, my coworker, your in laws. Praise the Lord. Hey, don't say that in church. Right? No, but we can. We can think of somebody who needs a savior. And the problem with that is, is we can allow ourselves to be let off the hook. But I would say this is as we condemn somebody else in need of a savior, we're actually placing ourselves in that category right alongside of them. Each of us have done something, many things actually, that would indicate that we have just as much of a need as somebody who we would say doesn't. Paul, one of Jesus's, not 12 disciples, but who became a follower of his and wrote a lot of what we have in this New Testament, was a church planter, and he would write letters to church to teach them about the theology of following Jesus and what it means. And this is something he wrote to a church in Rome that is on this topic. Romans 3.23, Paul says this, everyone has sinned. We all, every one of us fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. And the next part is he tells us the how. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. If you were to go on and continue to read that letter, Paul talks about how God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins. And what he does is he takes sinners People who are broken, who have messed up, who have done the most abhorrent and awful types of things, and he makes them right in his sight and invites us into a relationship with him, invites us to become a part of his family. And all of this indicates that there's something that we did that meant we needed a savior. That same guy, Paul, in that same letter writes this. He says, the wages of our sin is death. We all know this, like the work that you do, the actions you have carry a wage. Sometimes it's a good wage, but sometimes it's a bad wage. And what Paul is saying is every human who has ever existed because of the curse, because of the tainted sin, which we have willingly and actively been a part of, myself included, 
all of us brings about a wage of death. A first, a physical death here on earth, but then a spiritual death where we are separated from God's presence throughout all eternity. But the reality is God's desire is none of us would find ourselves in this place. So he went about doing something. And what he did was sent Jesus. This has been a part of God's plan throughout all of human history. If you go back before the time Jesus came to earth and what we call the Old Testament in our Bible, there were these men and women called prophets and prophetesses. And what they would do is take a word from God to the people. One of them was a man named Isaiah. And Isaiah spoke not about just what was happening now, but about the future and what God had in mind for creation for his people. He says this in Isaiah chapter 53, verse five. He says, he speaking about Jesus before he ever knew what his name would be. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and it is by his wounds we are healed. Before Jesus was ever on the scene, 700 years before he was born, Isaiah spoke about what it was that he would do. Listen, this is a theme throughout all of this Bible. Throughout all of scripture, in the New and the Old Testament, God pointing towards this idea, this thing that he wants to do in our lives. And the people of Israel knew this. In the time of Jesus, they were all looking for the day where this would happen. And then Jesus comes on the scene, and it's a little huh for people, because Jesus came as the type of savior that they really didn't expect. But in one of these grand moments where he makes it crystal clear exactly who he was, it has become very evident. And actually, this wonderful plan he had for everybody to hear and be a part and play a role in what it is that he wanted to do. It's a story where Jesus heals a paralytic man, which we will get into in a moment, but I want to give you the context and set the stage in it just for a second. It's very early in Jesus's ministry on earth. He's called the disciples, so he's got them following him, but he's just started to teach and do some of the things that are going to make him famous. So people are hearing about him. Some of them want to get in front of him, and the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the ones who eventually put him to death are interested in who he is. If you read the text, you're told that all of these men from Judea, from Galilee, from Jerusalem have come to hear Jesus. Like this is a really big moment in Jesus's ministry. And I think the reason it was like this is these scribes, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, Jesus wanted to invite them into this dynamic. And we get to see what happens. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the story, this is going to be a little bit of a, a retell for you. But what happens is Jesus is there teaching. There's a great crowd around him, and it's near somebody's home. And there's a group of people that come, and they're bringing their friend because they believe that Jesus can do something to heal him because he is paralyzed. But as they get close, they realize there is no way their crowd is going to get through the group in order to see Jesus. So they look around, and they come up with a plan that they can access the roof of a house, and they are going to remove it to let their friend down and through, which is what they do. And as they are removing the roof and letting him down, Jesus sees the man. He sees his faith and his friend's faith, and this is what he says. Luke chapter five, verse 20, it says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, the paralyzed man, young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. I wanna take a second and stop here because I think it's important to recognize what the Pharisees say and the Pharisees get a bad rap and actually justifiably so, but they were incredibly prudent to do what they did in this moment. You see, their jobs as the religious leaders, as the people who taught this law and made sure that people understand it would be when somebody comes claiming to be God, that that's somebody who should be checked. It's somebody who should be checked to see if what they're talking about is true, if what they're talking about is correct, and they do that. They are amongst themselves in a place where Jesus can't see or can see but can't hear them what is happening, and as they have said that, Jesus wants to show them who he is, so he responds, and we get to see his response in the next set of verses. This is what Jesus says. It says, Jesus knew what they were thinking. Another translation says he perceived their thoughts, so he asked them, why do you question in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? Well, check this out in verse 24. He says, so I will prove to you that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said to him, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately everyone watched as the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. You see, Jesus had some ideas about what he wanted to have happen in this moment. See, I think Jesus actually had a big plan for the religious leaders and the Pharisees to be a part of making him known to everybody because they would have known this book better than anybody else. This is the Old Testament. It's about this much of it, three quarters of our Bible. And it all points to the fact that there was going to be a Messiah coming in a certain way. And Jesus saw these men, these individuals that knew it cover to cover in a way nobody did. And they could approach people and present to them how all of this pointed to Jesus, where these people would be able to walk into a relationship with them. But they miss it. They don't understand who he is for a lot of reasons. And in this account, what Jesus does is he goes a step further to prove who he is. Remember, he says, hey, your sins are forgiven. And they say, that's blasphemy. Only God can do that. You're absolutely right. So I'm going to show you now who I am. And that's when he forgives, or not forgives the man, but tells him he can walk. Like, listen, guys, I'm demonstrating who I am to you because there's an invitation for you to come into this greater plan. And I know it's important for you to know who it is that I am in this moment. That phrase, son of man, in the verse is something we can quickly overlook. It was the, one of Jesus' favorite ways to describe himself. And all of the people would have known the claim that Jesus was making. Son of man is used at a minimum of 80 times in the Old Testament, and it is all pointing to the future God who would come to the earth to save the people. So you can have opinions about Jesus, but honestly, if you're saying that he's not God or he never claimed that, it does not line up with the detailed accounts we have of his time here on earth. Jesus made it very clear that he was coming to be a savior, and not just any type of savior, but a sacrificial savior. You see, in this moment, I don't think Jesus only said your sins are forgiven to prove who he was, but to demonstrate while physical healing was important, it was secondary here on this earth. You see, sin creates a bond on us and not a good one. Its wages are death. It brings about a negative, a bad, a horrible just dynamic in our life. And what it does is it clamps down us. And Jesus is saying, I've come to remove this. Jesus came to free us, to free humanity from the bonds that sin places on us. And in this moment, he wants to make it clear to not just the people, but the teachers who could then take this message to the rest of the world. As I'm sure most of us are familiar with the story, that's not what happened. The scribes, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, at least the overwhelming majority of them don't believe Jesus. They don't believe that he's who he says he is. And they actually have a significant problem with him because his authority is starting to surpass their own and they want him gone. So they end up creating a plan. They connive and they scheme to have him executed because they weren't allowed to execute people in this point. Rome was over them and they needed Roman permission. So they get Jesus in front of Pilate. And as Pilate is addressing the situation, he's looking at it going, this guy has done nothing. Absolutely nothing deserving of what it is that they are saying. So in order to save Jesus, but also to appease these scribes and Pharisees, he says, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to beat him. Like, I'm going to wail on him or have guards do it pretty significantly, and hopefully that will satisfy what they want, and he will be able to let go. But what is incredibly interesting is, again, what the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders did, which says what they thought Jesus was claiming. John chapter 19, verse 7, they respond to Pilate after he says this, and it says, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. See, it was very clear, not just to Jesus, but to these men, what he was claiming. And if Jesus wasn't claiming to be God, if there was ever a time to cut and run, this is it. (laughs) This is the moment where he says, whoa, hold up, guys. I think we got our lines crossed. I was just trying to, like, help the morality of the culture. I was just trying to get people to understand a little bit more. I'm not claiming to be God, but as we know from the text and the passages, Jesus doesn't do that. He stands by silently, willing to go to what it is next because this was the mission that he came for. Jesus came to be a sacrificial savior and this all ends up with Jesus hanging on a cross. 
There's four or a couple of different accounts of Jesus hanging on the cross. And I love these accounts because what we get is different pictures of what it is that actually happened. I know some of you would say, well, doesn't that contradict and mean it's probably unreliable? Actually, the opposite is true. If you were to watch something and I was to watch something and we were to write it down, the grander idea of what would happen would be there, but there'd also be different details that I thought were important and you thought were important. And we see that in the Gospels. And one of Jesus' disciples, Matthew, relays what happened. And he says this in his account. He says, as Jesus was there, everybody gets on him. The scribes, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they start hurling insults is how the text describe it. They are berating Jesus. They are belittling him. The soldiers get in on it, and it gets so bad that the two other men who are being crucified with Jesus do it as well. They're berating him. They're making him be belittled in this moment where they're dying as well. But what we find in Luke's text is while that is happening, Jesus does something. And it gets back to this idea of where the person who was hurting and paralyzed, yeah, Jesus met his physical need, but there was a deeper spiritual need that was more important. And that gets put on full display here as Jesus is talking to these individuals. I love what it says, Luke chapter 23, Jesus speaking, it says this, or speaking, it happens this. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Notice it's singular. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us, he said. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence and we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom." Jesus looked at him and said, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. How does a guy go from hurling insults at Jesus to finding himself in this space? And I think there is only one answer. That's Jesus went after him. Jesus saw this man hanging on a cross, actually two of them hanging on a cross, and knew that they were in the greatest need of anybody in the outdoor space for what it was that he had come to offer. Like these two people were going to meet a physical death very soon, and they were headed for eternity, separated from Jesus, not with him, not near him, not a part of him. So he went after them. The text doesn't say this, but this is my thought. I I don't know if he spoke to them. I don't know if he just looked at them, but something happened in one of these man's life where he understood who Jesus was. And in it, we get a beautiful picture of the gospel because if it's about our good works and our, our righteous deeds outweighing what we've done that is wrong, this man wouldn't be in heaven with Jesus like he said he was, but he is. And the reason he is there is because he understood Jesus came to be a sacrificial savior, not somebody who would add up your good as opposed to your bad at the end of your life and allow you into his kingdom if the scales fell to the correct side. This man needed his insides healed in a way his outsides wouldn't receive. And Jesus watched him, saw him, and went after him and helped him walk right into this moment in the greatest, one of the greatest depictions of what following Jesus and how getting to know him comes about in anyone's life. Have any of you ever seen the movie The Mummy Returns with Brandon Fraser? Can I get a hand? Okay, it's on TNT once in a while. It's not a bad movie. You should all check it out. In the final scene, when the victory is won, the hero of the story, Brandon Fraser, is in a really precarious situation. He's hanging from a cliff, the tomb or the temple or whatever it is, is crashing down all around him. And it's very obvious that unless somebody intervenes on his behalf, he is not going to get up. He's not going to make it and he's not going to be saved. And as we're watching, you see his wife in the distance under the safety of a cliff where she is not being in any way threatened. And she's by her son and Brandon Fraser looks at her and he starts to scream at her and he says, don't you dare come out after me. Because he knows as she does that, she will be in jeopardy as well. The camera focuses in on his wife and she tilts her head to the side and she says nothing, but you can see in her eyes exactly what she is thinking. And she says, not audibly, but in her mind, husband, I'm not listening to you. She runs out into the fray with the rocks and everything falling around her in order to rescue her husband. And the reason I tell you that story is that is a beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us. 
The difference was, if she made it back unscathed, Jesus knew that wasn't going to be his end result. See, there's a lot of religions and a lot of people that talk a lot about gods and the way they think about us and how they view us. And the reality is some of those have thrown out some lifelines. Like from their ivory tower, they've said, here, figure it out, save yourself. But the big difference in Christianity and following Jesus is Jesus doesn't just throw us a lifeline. Jesus entered the fray and he became the lifeline. He became the lifeline that all of humanity would need to be reconciled back to himself. And he went through one of the most torturous, horrendous ways to die so that we could be with him. And in doing that, we also get to see what the essence of the Christian gospel is, is compared to every other religion. You see, every other religion says, you gotta have that good add up and outweigh the bad. That's how you do it. That's why nobody can ever feel that they've done enough because you're like, have I? I don't get to see the scales, but I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna work hard. And while following the rules and following the ways of Jesus is so good for us in our life, that's not how we get there. We get there like the thief on the cross. The guy who was like, I don't have a moment to outweigh the things that I have done. And what he did had to be bad because he was being crucified. But he looked at Jesus understood that he was the hero of the story and he came to be a sacrificial savior. And he said, I want to follow you. Never had a moment to do a good deed. Never had a moment to make himself right, quote unquote, in front of God, but put his faith and his trust in Jesus. And because of that, he will spend eternity forever with him. And those of us that do the same, that don't try to stack up our good against our bad, will get to see him, get to hear him and get to understand what it was like for him in that moment. That is the message of the gospel. The essence of the Christian gospel is this. We do nothing. It's something we receive. It is not about what we do. It's actually about what God did for us. That's what the angel told the shepherds. I bring you good news of great joy that's going to be for all people because today a savior has been born. Not a judge who's going to look and see if your good outweighs your bad. No, no, no. If somebody said, I'm wiping that slate clean when you decide to follow me. See, the reality is Jesus, God, has a family, and we aren't automatically grafted into that. But what he does is he looks at every single one of us, and he says, I want to adopt you into it. I want you to be a part of it. It's very clearly depicted in one of, if not my favorite, chapters in the entire Bible. So it's uh, the book of John, which is one of Jesus' disciples. He says it like this. He says, Jesus came into the very world he created, and the reason he came was so that everyone, who believed in him would be accepted. And then he gave them the right to become the children of God. That is the gospel, plain and simple, crystal clear, nothing that we do. That same guy, Paul, that we talked about before, wrote another letter to a church in Rome. And he says, in that, right in the beginning, he says, there's this Old Testament law. And the people thought that's how you got to heaven. And he looked at them and he said, if you're thinking the law is going to save you, the standard is perfection. Every time, every way, you must fulfill exactly what it says. And if you ever make a mistake once, which everybody had gone in in a much deeper and more extensive manner, you can't find forgiveness in that way. But then the next part he says is so great. He says this, he says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring that you have faith, that you are saved. You see, that's what the thief got. It was the inside that mattered. And when his inside reflected what Jesus done, and he's openly declare it, he is now saved and he is in eternity forever with God. We're going to give you the chance to think about that. And if you want to make that decision today, but this is who God is. I was at that funeral and I heard a friend of mine, I can't see him, but I know he's in here somewhere, say this. He says, like, God is coming after us the way he is coming to the thief on the cross. And if you think you are 10,000 steps away from him, he will take 9,999 of them. But he never takes the last one. The last one is when he extends an invitation, just like he did to that thief. And he says, now it's your turn to come and follow me. And if we will follow him, I'm telling you, 
He wants to set you into the best, craziest, wildest journey that you have ever been a part of. And it's gonna be the best thing that you've ever done and it's also gonna be the hardest thing that you've ever done. But as you journey with him and you do learn about what he says and you start to commit to it and say, I wanna follow because I know that you created me and you say, this is what's right. He's gonna change you. He's gonna change the people around you. And what he had hoped for the Pharisees and the religious leaders in that moment that they would walk into is what we will be a part of, which is this being a part of a wonderful organization that he calls the church so that every one of us will know who he is and play a role in helping other people come to find him. That's who Jesus is. That's why he's a sacrificial savior. He wasn't just a good dude. He was God in the form of man who suffered so that we could know him. Would you all pray with me? Father, um, man, I thank you for the way that you love us. Man, there's some wrecking in the best kind of way that happened in my life, and I am incredibly thankful for it. My hope and my prayer is in this room there would be some people today that would do some business with you. They would understand the way that you love them, the way that you care for them, and how you want to help them walk into not the easiest kind of life, but the best kind of life. And as you do that, you will reveal yourself to them. Your character will become known. Something radically amazing and wonderful will happen. May we be a place where that is known. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to, when I say we, Davy and Amira are going to lead us in a song called Blown Away. And I would encourage you, hang out in your seat. This song is such a beautiful, theologically correct description of what it is that Jesus did for us. But I want to highlight one thing because it's probably my favorite lines in the whole song. It says this. It says, what you went through to love me, I'll never understand. But what my blows my mind away is you love me just as I am. There's no cleanup before you get to know Jesus.
take a couple of minutes now and you should have got the communion elements on your way in to remember what it was that Jesus did for us. It's really interesting if you read the gospel accounts where it details Jesus having the last supper with his disciples. He tells them to remember him. That you're going to do something now and then after I am gone this will be the thing that you remember it as you do it. But the thing that always sticks out to me is again we have a God that we serve who is so worth remembering that he would allow himself to leave heaven and become a sacrificial savior so that we get to know him. That's the God that we get to remember. It says that as he was with the disciples, he took the bread and he told them, this is my body that is broken for you. So when you eat it, as often as you do it, remember what it was that I did for you. Let's remember together. After he took the bread, it said he also took a cup. <laughs> and he looked around the room. And he looking at his disciples and he said, this represents the blood of this new covenant, of this new thing that I came to do for you and for everyone that will walk this earth after you. Every time you drink it, remember me. Remember what I did and remember why I came. Let's drink together. Father, um, I know there are times where it can just, I don't know, get lost on us, but we can forget what you did, what you went through, and even the way you came. My hope and prayer that is, 
as we are here and as we get ready to leave and go throughout our life, that we would take moments to remember what it is that you've done for us. And I pray each of us would walk a little bit deeper into that today. Before you lift up your heads for my prayer, I just ask everybody to keep your, your head bound and your eyes closed just for a minute. Like, listen, this is, this is who we are. We unashamedly will say to you that we declare the message of Jesus and we think it has the power to change lives. And I just believe in this room that some of you are thinking about that. Maybe even some of you are on the fence or you walked into it for the first time with Jesus. If you're one of the persons in this room that's on the fence or thinking about it, I want you to look up at me and maybe just slip your hand up as well so that I can see you while nobody else has their head up. Like, listen, this is the reason that we are here and we believe Jesus came to set each and every one of us free. And I would encourage you, consider this. Maybe you're ready to make this decision wherever you are. At the end of our service, when we're all done, me and our prayer team are gonna hang up here at the right. We just wanna have the opportunity to pray for you. If you have any questions or if you've walked into this relationship for the first time, we would love to meet you and we would love to help you with some next steps is what it would be for you to walk on this journey with Jesus. But regardless, I hope that you will leave here today remembering the type of savior he is. He is a hero that loves us that sacrificed himself so that we could know him. We're gonna sing one more song. And if you are done doing some business with the Lord, I would encourage you to stand up as we sing one more song that just reminds us about the type of savior we have and that we serve. Would you stand and sing with us together? God in heaven, your blood 
by the words of this song because of the reality and the, the weight that they hold. When we sing those words, your cross, my freedom, it is at the death of Jesus, his sacrifice, not just as a man, but as God himself sets us free. And the stripes, the wounds, the nails in his hand, the crown of thorns on his head where the spear pierced his body. His wounds become our healing, the blood of Jesus washing over us, making us new. His blood is still speaking power into every single one of us. And his love is still reaching to the ends of this earth in every facet of your life, of those around you, at home, in the workplace, wherever you go, to the end of time and every age. The love of Jesus is enough and his power is above all things. Jesus, King Jesus is above all. I want to take this as an opportunity to invite you into a moment to respond to that truth, to that reality. What Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection is not just an event to remember, but it is a moment for us to accept the invitation that Jesus is giving us to start this life with him, to live alongside, to abide in him, to become more like him that we may know life to the full here, but yes, into eternity. Life with Jesus forever, such a gift. And so we exalt his name. We lift the name of Jesus above all things when we sing all praise, King Jesus. So let us do that now. Let us say, Jesus, you are above all things. King Jesus, you are more than anything that I could ever want or hope for. Jesus, you are Lord and you are Savior. Let's sing that together and proclaim that truth over ourselves and our community. Your cross, my freedom. Your cross is my freedom. Your stripes are my healing. All praise, King Jesus. Be to God in heaven. Your blood is still 
Listen, I said I would give you the opportunity if you're struggling with this or you've walked into it for the very first time. Myself and our prayer team are going to be down here to the right. We would love to pray for you or to hear from you, especially if you for the first time have decided to go on in this journey. I got to talk to somebody in the first service that is struggling because he's doing it alone. We were not made to run this race alone, and we want to be a community that does far more for you than just worship together on a Sunday. We want to be in the grit and the grind of life with you. So if you are one of those people, come down and speak with us. We would love to have a conversation with you. But if not, we're so glad that you were here with us. We hope you have a fantastic Sunday, and we will see you back here next week. Thanks for being here, everybody. Have a great Sunday.